Um, okay, let me temporarily take off my mask. So it's my great honor to uh, invite Dr. Uh, Wallace Marshall to give us a seminar today. Uh, Wallace is one of the best role model you can find in inter uh, interdisciplinary uh, cell biology research. Uh, he approaches biology uh, with an engineer's philosophy. So he started with a highly interdisciplinary education uh, background. So he got his Bachelor of Engineering uh, in Electrical Engineering and Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry, double degree from SUNY Stony Brook. And then he got his PhD in Biochemistry from UCSF. And then he did his postdoc in Cell Biology at Yale University. And then in 2003, he returned to UCSF and uh, uh, became a tenure track faculty there. And he's currently a full professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics and director of the Center for Cellular Construction. Uh, so Wallace's lab focuses on very fundamental and very interesting uh, questions about how cells and tissues create complex structures and how they count and measure uh, to control the development of those uh, structures. So he combines his engineering background and approach these questions with a unique engineering perspective. So for example, he tries to find out the algorithms uh, based on which the cell operates. And he uh, uses very unique uh, organisms to address the questions too, uh, which uh, we will hear one of those organisms today. Um, and uh, was also took many initiatives to promote quantitative cell biology that incorporates uh, different disciplinary views. Uh, he not only uh, does this as a director of the cell Center of Cellular Construction at UCSF, but he organizes many, many uh, great events for the broader community like the Woods Hole Physiology Course, uh, Cold Spring Harbor Computational Cell Biology Conference, the NSF Quantitative uh, Cell Biology Hackathon, just to name a few, and there are many more. And these are great events that helps people from dis uh, different disciplines connect and uh, build collaborations. Um, and um, I think was one of the coolest person <laughs> I've ever met. He always come up with uh, very sharp ideas and humorous comments about research, about life, and about everything. So I always learn a lot from uh, talking with him. So today we're gonna him talking about the pattern formation and regeneration in a single cell in a very unique organism. So uh, for those who attend online, please put your questions in the Q and A. Uh, and at the end of the talk, uh, uh, we're gonna address those questions. And who have signed up for lunch with uh, Wallace, please stay in the room. Uh, after the seminar. I think the lunch is just uh, across the hall. Okay, it's all yours. Uh, thank yes. you, Jing. Jabu, how is it? Not at all. So um, thanks everyone for, for joining in person and, and for those at, at home in the studio audience, uh, in, in the home audience, thank you for also for dialing in. Um, please interrupt me if, if, I, if the sound isn't coming through. I'm gonna try to stand more or less in front of the microphone, but if I start to drift, just, just tell me. So yeah, thanks so much, Jing. It's really a pleasure to, to be here and um, and to be invited by Jing, who I feel is, as I told her, I feel like the, the sort of the the natural um, um, kind of an inheritor of the tradition of John Tyson of using math in really innovative ways for in cell biology. So it's it's a great honor to be invited here and also by her in particular. So I'm going to tell you about our efforts to study <clears throat> this um, basically developmental biology of a single cell, and part of the motivation for this is that in development people tend to think about cells as something small, simple, and stupid, like a Lego brick. And the only way to make anything interesting at all is to have lots and lots of cells, right? And that's how you build up complexity. And this is not really fair, I think, speaking as a cell biologist, because cells can actually have very, uh, cells do have very complex and beautiful structures. And this is true not only for free living single celled organisms, like some of these shown along the top, it's also for true, true of cells inside the, the bodies of multicellular animals and plants. And one example that I really love is, is the hair cell of the inner ear shown on the uh, hair cell of the ear shown on the bottom, where a single cell makes this beautiful um, organ pipe like array of stereocilia, which is necessary for sensing uh, sound. And the thing about it is what I find very striking is that molecular biology has taught us well, basically all the building blocks. We know all the proteins that make up these stereocilia. What we know a lot less about is how the cell puts them together into this pattern. So you know, what are the algorithms or, or mechanisms the cell uses to build these shapes? And I think part of the problem is that molecular biology as a field is very good at finding molecular scale explanations for molecular scale phenomena. And the problem is when you wanna ask about phenomena that are happening at a larger than molecular scale, it's less obvious how to do that using the, the, the usual methods of molecular biology. 
The people who thought a lot about how to find explanations at this larger than molecular scale are developmental biologists and embryologists. This is what that, those whole fields are really all about. And so the question is, can we, uh, can we learn in cell biology how to take more of an embryology kind of approach to the cell? And it turns, so in thinking about this, we went back in history and there is actually one, one standout organism that was a classic single cell model for taking an embryological approach to cells. And, that, and that's the one shown here, Stentor ceruleus. So Stentor is a ciliate like Tetrahymen or a Paramecium, just a, a lot bigger. So one cell typically is one to two millimeters long. So you can see them without a microscope. They grow in ponds all over the world. Um, you basically, um, you have to hunt for them a little bit, but they're, they're, they're all over. Um, they're bright blue, so they're very easy to see. The surface is covered with blue stripes, which give you basically a, a natural um, reference frame sort of printed onto the surface of the cell, so there's a clear pattern. Um, so the left is a micrograph, the right is, is a hand drawing by, by Vance Tarter. And what you can see in the drawing is that at one end of the cell, let's see, I'll try to point with the, with, can, can people see the pointer if I do that? Okay, good. So at one end of the cell, there's this ring of cilia called the oral apparatus or the membranellar band. And that defines an anterior end. At the other end, there's a hole fast where the cell attaches to the substrate and that defines a posterior. So the cell has an anterior posterior body axis. If you look at the blue stripes, they're of different width. So there's some very wide stripes. And then as you go around the cell, they become more and more narrow. And there's a point where the most narrow stripes and the wide stripes meet each other. And that defines a ventral surface. So you get a dorsal ventral axis. And then every other part of the cell, the contractile vacuole, the macronucleus, is always on one side or the other of, of, that, of the midline that's defined. So you have a clear left and right axis as well. So even though it's a cell, it has all the same body axes that, that an animal would have. Um, and I want to call your attention to this macronucleus here. So, so ciliates, as you may know, have both micronuclei, which are diploid, and then macronuclei, which are polyploid. And it is the macronucleus that's actually expressed to produce, to, um, to produce mRNA. And it's where the macronucleus runs down the length of the entire cell. And it looks like a string of beads, but, it's, um, but, it, but it is one continuous closed nucleus. <coughs> so why was Stentor so popular? So, so this is very popular about 100 years ago. And a lot of the leaders in embryology, you know, Balbiani, Morgan, and others were working on Stentor to understand development of, of cellular structure. And part of why they, they wanted to use Stentor was because it was so big and had this conspicuous patterning and body axes and so on. But a second reason was 100 years ago, developmental biology was mostly done by cutting and pasting experiments. Where you take an embryo, cut a piece off, graft onto another embryo. That was like the main experimental method. And as you know, if you've ever tried to do this with a cell, it's very hard to cut cells and not destroy them. Most cells, if you cut them open, they'll just bleed out and die. Stentor was, was favorable because it's very, very good at wound healing and recovery. And I'm gonna show you an example. So you, so you can cut into cells, they don't die. Here, we're gonna take a Stentor cell shown here. We're gonna cut in with two glass needles. This was a crazy thing that we did at Woods Hole one summer. Cut in with two glass needles and pull the cytoplasm out. So it's like the death scene from the movie Braveheart. And then just watch what happens. <coughs> it all just flows back into place like the liquid metal Terminator in Terminator 2. And within a few hours, this cell is, is fully recovered and it's swimming around again, eating other cells. So the so center has this amazing ability to recover from wounds, which facilitated these kind of cutting and pasting and grafting experiments that were so popular for embryology um, you know, a century ago. And as a result, there's been a lot of huge literature of experiments do, of that type done on Stentor. So here's one by Thomas Hunt Morgan himself before starting Drosophila working on Stentor. And what Morgan did here was to take a Stentor cell, cut it in half, <clears throat> and then each half will recover and will regenerate a normal looking Stentor cell of half the correct size. And the interesting thing is that all the structures of the cell will rescale to be, to be proportional to this new smaller cell. So for example, the membranellar band, oh, I don't write, which is, you know, at, at this, this ring of cilia, each of these cells now has one that's half the original size. So all, so this is a great system for studying, you know, scaling of cellular structure is a very interesting question in, in general, I think, you know, nuclei and cytoplasm and so on. And this is definitely a system which does that very clearly. So Morgan showed, you know, this rescaling phenomenon, but this, and, and one thing I wanna call your attention to because it comes up later is that when you cut the cell in half, one half of the cell has the membranellar band from the old half and all it has to do is rebuild the tail the other half has the tail from the old cell and it's got a rebuild membranellar band and, the, and they each can do those things. So the cell can basically regenerate either missing structure. So this is one example. Um, oh, and let's see, where am I? Oh yeah, and so just, just to say, you know, what's actually happening? What is the basis of these structures that you see? It's really mostly what we're thinking about is basically it's a tubulin cytoskeleton is defining all of these structures. So if you, so if you stain cells with anti-tubulin antibodies shown here, you see this really bright ring of, of cilia, which is the membranellar band. 
And then you see these nice long longitudinal microtubule bundles. So these are actually not continuous microtubules. They're actually overlapping segments of, 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 of microtubule bundles that add up to be this you know, millimeter long um, filament. And, and that micro and that uh, sort of ultra structural level, what you actually have is you have these parallel microtubule bundles, but next to them are these uh, rows and rows and rows of, of, of pairs of basal bodies or centrioles. And in each pair, one of them makes a cilia. So the cells can swim using these, these cilia. So this is the basic structural motif that we're looking at. And the memorial band in particular is very interesting because if you zoom in on that, what it is is it, it's a ring composed of these rows of cilia. And those rows of cilia are basically clusters of basal bodies that are aligned in a row, basically using unknown mechanisms. And so when, you, when the cell regenerates this membranal band, it's actually rebuilding this incredibly complex structure. And so part of why we got into using, uh, studying Centaur was we're interested in centrioles. And this was a case where, you know, apparently there's a de novo assembly of thousands of centrioles under controlled conditions. So that was the idea anyway. Okay. So I, so I, I told you, I showed you Morgan's experiment that if you cut a cell in half, the posterior half has to rebuild this membranal band, making all those centrioles de novo. But you can also induce the same thing other ways. So if you, if you add sucrose to the media, the cell will actually um, release this membranal band and then re rebuild a new one. So it's like you add too much sugar and the cell jettisons its mouth. I, you know, I wish I could do that. Um, so, so, you, so you can do the sucrose shock, which is great because you could just dump it in in a whole flask full of cells and synchronously um, induce regeneration. But you can also do it surgically, um, either whole cell bisection like Morgan did, or you can just cut off just the membranal band. Either way, whatever you do, the same thing happens, which is the cell um, starts by clearing, let's see, what's my pointer? It clears a little region of, those, of the cortex, meaning it makes a break in those microtubule bundles. It then fills in that break with centrioles. Those centrioles then align. I'm, I'm gonna use centrioles and basal bodies interchangeably. I don't wanna get into argument about that. I, I realize there's some experts here who, but anyway, I'm just gonna use those terms. And, and so anyway, so then those, those, those basal bodies form a bunch of cilia and you get this, this, um, this oral primordium as it's called that forms. And, and, and when it first forms, it's linear. That then migrates up to the anterior end of the cell and loops around to form this final structure. Okay, so there's sort of this very consistent series of about eight morphological steps um, that have been defined and, the, and they happen in the same sequence no matter how you induce regeneration. So basically it's a program that once you trigger it, it just runs. <clears throat> so that's one regeneration paradigm, which is cutting off the membrane of band and watching it come back. But there's lots of others, there's a huge literature on this and Tartar in 61 published a book with literally hundreds of these kinds of experiments. So you can do things like cut off just the head or the oral apparatus. You can cut a central slice out from the cell and that thing will regenerate a normal cell. And this all works because you have this long macronucleus which is highly polyploid. So almost any way you cut the cell, you'll get enough of the genome to be able to regenerate. If you pull the whole macronucleus out, you can't regenerate. So you do, you do need that. You can graft cells together to make gigantic cells. You can pull out cytoplasm. You can, do, you can fold them over. Almost anything you do, the cell will eventually recover a normal structure. The exception is there are certain Siamese twin cells where if you graft cells together in the same polarity, you can then maintain a twin configuration for many generations. But almost anything else you do, the cell somehow recognizes it and is able to recover. So there's a huge literature of, this, of, of sort of the surgical type, but what was never really known was especially any, almost anything about how this works at a molecular level. And you might ask, well, why is that? That seems like a pretty, pretty obvious um, thing to want to wanna know about. <coughs> and I think to some extent, the answer has to do with the personalities involved. So, uh, so towards the, um, the end of Centaur as a system, so in, in basically in the 60s and 70s, the two main researchers were Vance Tartar and Noel de Terra. They were both extremely brilliant and creative um, in, in, their, in their own ways. So Tartar is one of my personal heroes because he was actually not an academic scientist. He did all of his research in a, in a shack in back of his house using tools he built himself. Um, <clears throat> he ended up being affiliated with the University of Washington in order to be able to apply for federal grants. But he basically just was, was a hobbyist essentially who, who, who did this, which is amazing. Noelle de Terra is another one of my heroes because she had, I would say, took Centaur to the highest level in terms of the complexity and elegance of her experimental design, grafting three different cells together in, in, in order to ask about whether the, the signals are, are being moving by diffusion versus by, 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 by microtubule trafficking, for example. So they're both extremely brilliant and creative. But neither one really wanted to pursue a molecular approach. And in particular, Tartar had a principled reason for this, which is he really articulated the view that he's looking at a supermolecular process and he, he didn't believe the explanation could be found in the molecules that were involved at some level. <clears throat> and I think it's obviously true that the molecules will not directly tell us what the mechanism is, but having those would obviously be an important first, first step. The other thing about the two of them is neither one of them trained any, um, they, they weren't big on training uh, trainees. So they just did their own thing. 
and that was it. And so um, when they passed away, there was no one left to carry on the work. So the field essentially completely died out. Lynn Margulis did a few inhibitor experiments afterwards, and that was basically it. Part of the problem was if you wanted to do anything, you know, of a biochemical nature, you know, it, it, I think back to the 70s, a, a lot of what you wanted to do would involve bucket scale biochemistry, growing up a lot of material and doing assays on that. And Stentor is a wonderful system unless you want to grow a lot of it. In that case, it's really, sorry, I don't know, did I do that? Well, anyway, um, sorry, for those at home, the, the lights just went down for a, is it like gesture control? Anyway. Uh, sorry. So you'll appreciate this, Danielle. So I'm actually Italian American and I, and, and I do this with my hands all the time. It's how I, um, not no, yeah, no, exactly. So, okay. So I'll just keep, yeah. So I'll just keep gesturing. <laughs> so what was I saying? Oh yeah. So, so, so the problem with Centaur, the doubling time is, is about four days. So to grow a large quantity is just not really practical. But nowadays we don't need large quantities, right? Technology has gotten to the point that single cells can be very useful for, for proteo, for, you know, for, certainly for genomics, but also even, even now for, for potentially for, for proteomics, for cell the size. This is thousands of times the size of a mammalian cell. <clears throat> so the key is to have the genome. So we, we ended up sequencing and assembling the genome ourselves with the help of, of experts from, from Joe DeRisi's lab. And you know, I had a bad attitude about the central genome. I figured who cares what the genome is? It's gonna be like everything else. It's a bunch of genes. There won't be anything interesting there. And in, in many respects, it was pretty much like your typical ciliate genome. Except the interesting thing is that almost all the introns are 15 nucleotides long, and the few that are not are 16 nucleotides long. So these, so this gigantic cell, you know, two millimeters long, has the smallest lysosomal introns of, of any eukaryote. It's smaller than than a lot of you know strictly parasitic um, um, eukaryotes. Why on earth that would be the case? I have no idea. If anyone has a theory about that, I would love to, love to hear it. Um, but the spliceosomal machinery looks totally normal. You know, there's nothing that you can say that that looks different about it. So it's really a puzzle. We also saw that the, that the genome contained all the components, you know, Dicer and Argonaut for doing RNAi. And indeed we found that um, since Centaur is a voracious predator, we can take the same bacteria and vectors used for RNAi by feeding, for example, in C. elegans and feed them to Stentor using Stentor genes as the targets and it worked great. So we get pretty reliable knockdown. <clears throat> Someone's gonna ask, so I'll forestall the question, why not just use CRISPR? And yes, we wanna do that. The problem is that the, um, from our genome sequencing, we could then do droplet PCR and determine the polyploidy of the macronucleus. And for most genes, it's about 50,000 ploid, except for the, 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 for the contact with the RDNA, then it's a million, a million ploid. So if we were to go into CRISPR gene editing of a couple of copies of, out of 50,000, we wouldn't really see much of an effect. If we could edit the micronucleus, which is diploid, and then take the cells through a round of mating and meiosis, then we could regenerate new macronuclei that would be homozygous for whatever edit we put in. And the problem is we have not yet figured out a way to cause cells to mate when we want them to. Sometimes you'll come in and they're all just mating, but months and months and months can go by and they aren't mating. So there's something we're missing. It could be something in the microbiome. So, we're, so before we, until we can figure out that, we're not actually working very hard on, on CRISPR, but it is on the list ultimately. <clears throat> but RNAi is working very well in our hands. You know, again, the RNAi by feeding is nice because you put in a whole gene, not just an, a small 20 tumor. And so you, you get like, you end up getting really reliable knockdown with, with um, not a lot of off target in cases where it's been tested. All right, so what is our, our goal? The short-term goal, this is not the ultimate goal, right? The short-term goal is to at least figure out what are some of the molecules or pathways that are required either to build structure in the first place or to regenerate it once it's been perturbed. The ultimate goal is to learn how it works as a process, right? So, you know, questions like, is the cell monitoring its own geometry? Is it adapting in response to feedback controls and so on? But the short-term goal is to get the tools to ask that kind of question, which is find out what are the genes, what are the pathways? And so, the chat, and so we, we have, you know, RNAi is, is clearly working very well. The question, the question is what, what candidates should we, should we check? So, so, so the, sort of the, the immediate term challenge is figuring out which genes to even look at. So, you know, one, one strategy to find candidates is to guess, to say, well, we know that kinases regulate all kinds of things. So let's look at kinases. Or we know the cytoskeleton is involved, obviously. So let's look at cytoskeletal proteins. So we've been, we've been working on this. So we have a collection of about 13, um, 1300 RNAi constructs in the freezer ready to go. We're sort of working our way through those. Um, and, so, and as you can see here, we're getting various um, um, morphological phenotypes. So instead of cells looking like this beautiful um, you know, wine glass shape, you have cells with multiple tails or that are flat like a leaf and so on. <coughs> None of these in themselves tell you how anything works, but they at least show you candidates that potentially are involved. I'm just gonna give you a couple of examples from, from this kind of, of, of experiment. So one is tubulin, you know, it's kind of a no brainer. We know the entire set of scale, you know, the, the cell is patterned like a tubular bundle. Let's try knocking down tubulin. Now the cells ultimately die, but before they die, they go through um, a, a, a very nice uh, 
quite prolonged stage where what you see is instead of having these beautiful, so this is tubulin staining, instead of having these long, nice, smooth microtubule bundles, you end up having these little chunks of tubulins with sort of gaps in them. They're still arranged in linear rows, implying that there's something else maybe that's not tubulin-based, another protein that's forming this fiber, which is not surprising. In paramecium, for example, we know there's other proteins that make similar fibers. If we look by polarized light microscopy, um, in, in normal cells, you can see the, the birefringent microtubule bundles. And then in the knockdown, what you see is that there's often gaps, there's holes where, the, where these bundles are broken. And then in, um, in contrast to a normal cell that will have a single hold fast, the microtubule knockdowns will often have two or more additional hold fasts. And we can show that they're all actually functional to attach to substrates. So the working model we have, which we still haven't, haven't, haven't proven, but the idea is that suppose there's some um, morphogen, I'm gonna use the term morphogen as just a molecule which determines the, the, the fate of a region where the molecule accumulates, which is how Turing described it when he first defined the term morphogen. So people always yell at me and say, I'm not using morphogen the right way, but I'm gonna go with the way it was defined. So if people don't like that, sorry. Um, so it's held determining morphogen, which is trafficked on the microtubules towards the minus end. Normally in a, in, a, in a wild type cell, because the microtubule bundles are parallel with the plus ends near the, near the membrane alar band and the minus ends are down at, at, the, at the posterior, whatever this molecule is will accumulate then at the posterior and then it can induce formation of a hold fast there. And when, when what we think is happening is that when we um, knock down tubulin, you start to get these breaks. So now you have free minus ends in the middle of the cell. This, morph this tail determining morphogen can accumulate there and cause a new tail to sprout out. Now, the way to really test this is to do time-lapse imaging and show that indeed the tails sprout out of regions where there was a break. That's been a lot harder to do than we thought it would be because it, it, again, it takes days for the phenotype to develop. Um, and if you try to um, put the cells in a little chamber to hold them still, they starve because they have to constantly be eating new food. So um, a student of mine, David Bauer, finally built a device <clears throat> that allows you to trap a cell in a microfluidic chamber and then feed it in um, a supply of, of, of living algae through tiny little holes the central can escape from. So I think we have the tools ready. We just haven't actually gone to that final step. So this is one example. Another example that um, was quite striking was um, we, we knocked this. So Mark Slobodnik, who was a student in my lab who really got centered going, he, he actually was, took the lead on sequencing the genome, got RNAi working. And, and one of the genes that he looked at was MOB1. So MOB1 is this highly conserved um, uh, uh, kinase scaffold. And it's conserved, you know, it's in humans and plants and yeast and so on. And um, in Centaur, when, when, when he knocked it down, you get this cell um, where, where the cell has multiple holdfasts. It, it kind of looks like, we call it the Medusa, but actually it kind of reminds me more of a bagpipe with all these little tubes sort of coming off of it. And if you look um, by immunofluorescence compared to a normal cell, which has a single membrane alar band <clears throat> and these long microtubule bundles, now what you have is multiple membrane alar bands arranged kind of in a garland. So here's one with three. And each of those, <clears throat> if you track the microtubules back, each of those has a, a, a posterior pole associated with it. So you see there's actually three separate groups of microtubule bundles going out in three different directions. So the phenotype really is a failure to maintain a unified anterior posterior body axis within one cell, which to me is a very much an embryology kind of phenotype, not the typical cell biology thing that, that, that we see. And again, we don't know exactly how this is arising. We don't know the, which kinases are the, are the, are the relevant cl um, client for MOB1 in this case. Um, that's something that we're, that we're trying to investigate. We do know that where MOB1 is localized. So, it, so Part of why we looked at MOB1 in the first place was Elena Suarez's lab had found that um, MOB1 localizes in tetrahymena to the posterior pole. And indeed in stentor, it's also enriched in the posterior by immunofluorescence. So the, the idea is that maybe MOB1 is sitting at the posterior and activating some kinases, which then create a gradient of, of signals of some kind. That, that's one possibility. In terms of where the multiple tails come from, the, the current idea we have is that um, either during regeneration, but even during normal growth, the cell will sometimes have to replace the membranola band with a new one. And that's to maintain scaling. So as the cell grows, the membranola band becomes too small for the size of the cell, and it can't actually insert new centrioles into the existing band. So instead it removes the band and replaces it with a new one. And so cells are always spontaneously um, undergoing membranola band assembly. And what appears to be happening when we look by time-lapse imaging um, in MOB1 is that so normally the new membranola band will form and again, as I said, it forms on the side of the body kind of in a straight line, very much the way it forms when it regenerates. And then it has to migrate up to the end. And it appears to be this migration that is defective in MOB1. So instead of, instead of the band straightening, um, curling up and migrating, it just stays where it is. And then we see new posterior poles growing out basically in a direction determined by where the membranolar band is. So now we think we have evidence that actually the membranolar band is, is some, acting as an inducer to determine where where to, that makes it worse, actually. Anyway, to determine where the new posterior pole uh, will form. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that we can get by doing our RNAi experiments, and we're just sort of running through our collection um, 
and you know, as new candidates arise, we, we, we look into them. So various members of the lab are sort of looking at their favorite pathways. And I think that's been very productive. Right now, what we're doing, it has been, has been just you know, feed the construct and look at the cell morphology and say, do cells develop abnormal structures? So that's looking for genes that are involved in normal development. But we think there could be, you know, could there be genes that are specifically involved in regeneration? Is it the same mechanism or is there a different mechanism for regeneration? It's actually a very um, sort of classic question in, in the field of regenerative biology in general. So what we'd like to do is repeat the same RNAi screening, but in a case where the cells have to regenerate. <clears throat> the problem there is how to do it. You can cut cells in half with a glass needle. It's very easy. Put them on a dish, cut them, put them back in your chamber, and then watch. But that takes time. You know, if, you, if you're really fast, you could do like one a minute, which is fine if you want to just test a couple of cells. But for a screening kind of um, project, it's just too slow. So as a solution, we've been collaborating. Um, we started collaboration years ago with Cindy Tang's group at, at Stanford and Mechanical Engineering Department. Um, and so they've developed what we call the microfluidic guillotine, where it's a, it's a, 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 a channel in PDMS with a triangular blade which you can sell, uh, flow cells onto. And watch what happens when you flow the cells onto this. So it just cuts them cleanly in half and, and the cells recover from this at, at, as, as well as they would if you cut them in half yourself with a glass needle. So, it, but, but this we can do one per second and we can actually, um, they, they built an array of eight of these. So you can just jump down a plate and do well by well the entire plate. So we now have the tools to really do sort of high throughput regeneration experiments. And now the question is to go back and try to rescreen some of these things and also screen some of the genes that didn't give a phenotype in normal development and see do they actually have a phenotype just in regeneration. So this is all the sort of you know, unbiased screening, just guess what could be involved. That's one strategy. So a second strategy to figure out what candidates might be involved is to look at transcriptional profiling. And the reason why we thought this would work is we know from old surgical literature that if you pull the macronucleus out, the cell can't regenerate. If you let it start regenerating and then pull the macronucleus out, it basically stops wherever it was. It basically, it'll go for about one more hour and then it will stop. Um, and from these kind of experiments, it was known that there's about five stages, four or five stages where you need the macronucleus to go through distinct sort of like um, cutoff points. And if you pull it out, any one of those stages, it will go to the next stage and then arrest. And each of those is about an hour long. So we'd imagine that if we looked at gene expression, we might see about five waves of expression. And so um, my postdoc, Praniti Su, did this by RNA sequencing. Um, and so here, um, down at the bottom is a cartoon of the various stages of regeneration induced by sucrose shock. So the membrane oil band pops off and then comes back through these morphological stages. And indeed, by clustering, we see that there are about five um, clusters of, of gene expression. So if we ask you know, what genes are turned on at these different stages, <clears throat> so at, at the very first cluster is, uh, corresponds to when the cell has basically just finished shedding its membrane oil band and it's getting ready to start regeneration. And if you look at genes that are turned on, then you see a lot of genes involved in stress response. Not surprising, the thing's head has just been severed. I um, mean, there's also, there's ion channels, a lot of signaling molecules that maybe you're starting to trigger the, the pathway. Now, about an hour later, there's another cluster that turns on. And th the next cluster, this is at the stage where the cells are starting to make this break in the microtubule bundles. They're opening up a region where they're gonna build the membrane oil band and they're filling it up with centrioles. And if you look at what genes are turned on then, there's microtubule severing proteins, and there's also you know, the usual suspects of centriole biogenesis, SAS6 and so on. So this, this is very comforting because it suggests that indeed the, the molecules that are being expressed at a given stage do reflect the processes that we knew already were happening. And so we can flip that around and say, okay, now if we see other molecules being expressed, maybe those are also telling us about something that we didn't know already was happening and those would become new candidates. Okay, so an hour later, this is when the cell is growing cilia onto those basal bodies and we see a lot of factors involved in ciliogenesis. And then finally, at, at towards, um, towards the end, this is when the, the membrane oil band is, is migrating up to, to, the end, to, the, to the end of the cell. And so at, at this stage, we see a lot of um, uh, expression of genes involved in ciliary motility. So axonemal dynings, radial spokes, that kind of thing. And in fact, this corresponds to when the cilia start to beat. So earlier on, the cilia grow, but they're non-motile. Later on, they start beating, and that's when we see these genes upregulated. <coughs> we see a lot of mitotic, especially kinetochore proteins being turned on at this stage. Um, originally, we were thinking this might have to do with um, maybe the cell is sort of harnessing those to do some of this migration along the microtubule rows, which still is possible. But it's also true, if you look at the old literature, that it's been reported that um, the micronuclei undergo mitosis at the stage at this stage of, of regeneration for unknown reasons. So we think maybe that's all we're seeing. We don't actually know which of those it is. I mean, and, and, they, and those two things could be coupled, right? It's definitely possible that you could use the mitotic um, you know, cell cycle machinery, for example, to trigger different um, sequential steps of regeneration. 
Then the final stage, um, basically the cell is, is putting the membranola band into place and then it's building a gullet where it's gonna endocytose prey. And at this stage, we see again, more stress response um, and, and a lot of calcium related signaling. So this is interesting. We don't really know what's going on at this stage, but these all become candidates now to, to, to test. So one thing that, that we can look at now is it, you, we can look at groups of genes and ask, are there some that are different than the others and are they playing some unique role? So for example, um, we're interested in centrioles, we always have been. So we looked at all, basically a set of highly conserved sort of core centriole genes first defined by Juliette Zinzade when she was in the lab. And almost all, and these are centriole genes that are basically conserved in all species that have centrioles. And almost all of them have the, have an almost identical profile of expression. As, so this is basically showing the various genes as a function of times um, since, since um, induction and regeneration, except for one, which is LRC45. This is, this is being upregulated um, more than an hour after all the others. And so the question is what's happening when, when LRC45 is being upregulated? So this gets back to the question of well, where do the centrioles really come from? It's often been said that they, that they form de novo and, and there's some evidence for that, but a lot of the evidence for them forming de novo is the fact that if you look um, early in the, in the process, when you see all these centrioles forming, <clears throat> they're formed what they call an anarchic field that is the centrioles are rotationally disoriented from each other. So they're, they're, all, they're at all different rotational orientations, which is typically what happens when you trigger de novo assembly. So one, op one option is this in our field is actually showing de novo centriole assembly, but it's also possible, and, and this is seen in, in other ciliates that you actually form centrioles by canonical duplication, and then they dissociate from each other. So either way you end up with this sort of um, disorganized cluster, you know, the big pile of centrioles, which only later, organized into these nice linear um, rows that are gonna form the membranelles of the membranellar band. And it is the time that the centrioles undergo this regrouping when LRC45 is expressed. So it's you know, quite a bit after when the centrioles first form. And LRC45 in mammalian cells is involved in joining mother and daughter centrioles to each other. So we're thinking maybe this is playing a similar role here as, as a linker to build these structures. Okay, <clears throat> so what I showed you was regeneration following sucrose shock. But you can also ask, well, what about if you go back to Morgan's experiment and cut cells in half? And so, so here, um, you, um, the posterior half still has to regenerate the membranellar band. So it's doing the same morphological steps. So we did RNA sequencing on, on the posterior halves of bisected cells and compared that to the sucrose shock induced regeneration. And the main, there's really only one difference. Almost all the same genes, genes are expressed. The main difference is that when you do this experiment, we don't see expression of genes required for ciliary motility. And so the model we have now is that, and we don't really know why this would be the case, or, uh, but the model is that in this, in this case, when you cut the cell in half, it, it appears to be that the cell is using proteins that are already there to rebuild, to, to, to make the cilia motile. And so it's a repurposing of existing protein, which is, again, this gets back to sort of this fundamental theme in, develop, in regeneration of animals. You know, if an animal builds a new hand or something, is it making all those cells from scratch or is it re, re, you know, migrating cells in from somewhere else? So it's morphalaxis, versus epimorphosis. And we think that actually could be a little bit different in stentor depending on whether you do sucrose shock versus bisection. So, so now um, uh, a student at Ulysses Diaz is trying to um, label cells with, with, chem with fluorescent tag protein prior to regeneration and then asking, is that protein reutilized or is it new synthesis? But we don't have the answer to that yet. Okay, so, that's again, so, so, so that was the second strategy for finding candidates, which is do RNA sequencing and see what genes are upregulated. And that's give us, given us now a lot of, of, of new candidates to look into. Um, which I'll talk about some of those a little bit later. A third strategy go, is, is, is uh, proteomics, which asks what proteins actually are in some of the structures that you might want to regenerate, because you might imagine some of those would actually be involved in building that structure. Now, there may be other proteins involved in building it that aren't actually part of the final structure, you know, in the same way that, you know, GROEL was involved in building bacteriophage, but doesn't actually encode a bacteriophage protein. Um, those are also interesting, but at least one way to get candidates would be to see what is actually in these structures. So the membranolar band is very easy to remove with sucrose shock. And then these are actually big enough. You can hand isolate them with a glass needle and just collect them in a little tube. And then um, for the cell body that's left, um, this is done by um, my student, Athena Lin. She cut the cell in half and then collect each of the halves. So she has the tube and just dump all the anterior halves in one tube and all the posterior halves in the other tube. And we've been collaborating with Tao Leo at Pacific Northwestern to do the, the mass spec on these. And so this is, um, to cut a long story short, we, we can we see different, there's different classes of proteins that are specifically enriched in these various cellular regions. So for example, the membranolar band has a lot of cilia proteins. The posterior body has a lot of EF hand calcium binding proteins, which, I'll, which I, I'll talk about in a minute. But the point is we can see different, it's not the same proteins in all these different components. So we do think that there is actually um, differences here. 
And in fact, we, we, we estimate that about 25% of the proteome, at least what we detect, and I'm gonna say we're not like looking, we, we don't run forever, so we're, we're, not, we're missing low abundance things, absolutely. But about 25% of, of the abundant proteome is polarized in the sense that it's enriched in one, or in, in one versus the other of these anterior posterior um, fractions. And so this is actually, I think, a very sort of general question, how much of the proteome is, is polarized in a given cell type? And, you, and, and in, in yeast, it's about 2%, or 2 to 4% if you look at, at polarized structures around the butter, butt, neck. Um, in in, in um, mammalian epithelial cells, it's more like 90% if you look at just cell surface proteins. And centaur is apparently somewhere in, in between those two extremes. So just summarizing what we see, the membrane ulnar band obviously has lots of tubulin and axonemal dynein because it's got these, all these motile cilia. It also has three interesting classes, um, major vault protein, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, GAS2, which is this interesting family of, 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 of proteins that are thought to be involved in linking actin and tubulin in, in some way. And also uh, there, there's some very interesting um, calcium signaling proteins, including a CAM kinase. The top half of the body, so the top half of so the interior half of the cell body itself is enriched in mitochondria, which sort of fits what we see by microscopy. And then the bottom half is full of proteases, which we don't know why, and also um, EFM proteins, particularly those of the centrin family. And if you stain cells with centrin antibodies, um, this is done again by my student Ulysses, what, what we see is that indeed they are also very much enriched in, in that posterior half. So stentor cells, they stretch out like this cone when they're feeding, but when something scares them, like a predator hits them, they'll contract down into a ball. And that contraction is driven by centrin proteins that basically make these long filaments called myonemes. And so we think that's what we're seeing um, in, in this part of the proteome. Okay, and also um, one thing that we saw a lot of in the, in, in the membrane of our band was actin and, and actin binding proteins, which we, you know, there's not a whole lot known about actin function in ciliates. It's because, it's you know, things like phylloidin don't work and so on. But because Stentor is big and, and, and injectable, um, Ulysses Diaz has injected LIFAC GFP. And indeed we see it's, it, it goes straight to the membrane of band and makes some really weird structures in, in, inside the membrane of band that we don't really know what they are. Okay, so these are all the strategies that we have to get candidates and we've been, doing RNA on them. And I've only showed you some of the, some of the RNAi constructs that we've tested. And we see all kinds of interesting phenotypes in terms of cell shape. But everything that I've showed you so far is a little bit frustrating in the sense that although they make weird shapes, they still regenerate. So if you take, you know, for example, MOB1, sucrose shock it, it will rebuild membrane ulnar bands, even though they're, you know, they're screwed up in terms of their positioning and so on. PP2A, the cells are flat like a leaf, but they will still re rebuild the membrane ulnar band. Um, so they can restore their abnormal structure after perturbation. So we haven't found molecules from this that are actually perturbing the whole phenomenon that we wanted to study, which is this ability to regenerate geometry. And so this led to, um, I would say, I think I have, a, um, yes. So for, for years, we sort of had this, I guess, sort of existential angst, which is the whole reason we were studying Stentor was this ability to regenerate. Maybe regeneration is just so robust, you can't stop it with any single gene perturbation. And therefore the entire pipeline strategy we had is never gonna work. And that would, that would obviously, you know, if that's how it is, that's how it is, but that would be a little disappointing. So we're pretty happy um, that we, we, um, uh, we finally did find one gene that really perturbs regeneration. Sometimes it, 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 um, it, it, the cell will make a new membrane band that's just very, very small, but in some cells it doesn't make a membrane band at all. And so this was um, the results done by my student, Athena Lin. What is the protein that does this? It is Pomelio. Pomelio is this highly conserved RNA binding, RNA binding protein involved in development in, in lots of other species. So Drosophila is, is famous for this. So, you know, we've always said that we're gonna study cell regeneration and development using the same concepts as people used to study animal development, but we're not gonna see the same molecules. We're just gonna see this, maybe the same concepts and processes. But now we're actually seeing the, some of the same molecules doing similar functions. And so that's actually super interesting. So this is something that we're trying to dig into more um, so Centaur turns out actually has four different pomelios. Only one of them is upregulated. So that's, that's the one that, that we can knock down and get the phenotype. If we look at, um, pomelio is nice because it's known what kind of sequences the protein binds. It typically binds sequences in the, in the three prime UTR of its targets. If we look in Stentor genes, the genome is highly depleted for, for pomelio binding sites. But when they are there, they're always in groups and they're always in three prime, three prime UTR of target genes. So we think they actually probably really are um, bona fide pomelio targets. It's probably working the way it does in, in, in animals. So that's potentially very exciting that this single cell is maybe leveraging, well, I would, say, I would say the way around, which I think animal development has probably leveraged mechanisms that were first put in place for developmental biology of single cells. And that, that actually then gets us around this whole sort of um, um, uh, intelligent design argument from creationists that how could all this have ever, have ever evolved to make such complexity? I think the complexity was already there 
in the unicellular precursors and animals just, just leverage that. So we can now look at things like, hey, what are, what's going on with these familial targets? So familial, one of the familials is upregulated during regeneration. But then it turns out we, if, we, if we look at targets, a lot of the targets are also upregulated at different stages of regeneration. They don't fall into any particular gene family, right? So we see, you know, just this, you know, um, this is just random examples, you know, so there's, you know, some kinases, some cyclins, we don't really know what's special about them, but at least now these become really high priority new targets to look at um, for, our, for our testing. So one thing that, that's, that none of this is, you know, all the phenotypes that we've gotten, we, we have phenotypes where our cells either, for familio, they either don't regenerate or don't regenerate very well, or we have ones where they make sort of abnormal structures, but they still regenerate. What we really would like would be uh, to, to know about how does a cell know that it has to regenerate in the first place? Again, a classic question of regeneration. How do you know, you know, if you're a salamander and your leg is cut off, how do you know that your leg has been cut off? What is the signal? And it gets to the question of, you know, can cells sense their own geometry? Because, you know, in terms of, you know, again, going back to sort of you know, feedback control mechanisms for, for building structure, if cells have pathways to sense things like distance and angles, that would be very, you know, that would that could explain how they regenerate, but then, you know, how on earth would that work? So if you could, you know, imagine a molecule that can sense, you know, to some extent, we, we know that when you perturb cells by these various surgical processes, it, it, genes are being turned on in response to that perturbation. So, you know, how do genes know to turn on in response to a, you know, a millimeter scale spatial, spatial difference? That's, to me, a really interesting question. So, th so how would we identify such a gene? Well, the phenotype we would like to have would be something which when you knock it down, the cell just starts regenerating spontaneously or something like that. So like, is, you know, is there normally an inhibitor? And there's, there's some evidence from foreign inhibition. So, so Iver and coworkers did an experiment where normally shown on top, if you remove the membrane ulnar band, it will build a new one by the process that I, that I showed you already. But what they did was they took extra membrane ulnar bands that they isolated and surgically implanted them inside a cell and then cut off the old membrane ulnar band from the anterior end. And what happens in that case, sorry, I'm trying to get the lights on. What happens in that case is the cell actually fails to regenerate as though the presence of a membrane ulnar band is, is sufficient to inhibit. Oh yeah, see. Is, so, so that suggested all along that the membrane ulnar band might be sending out some kind of inhibitory signal. And this would be an obvious way to trigger regeneration. Right? As long as the membrane ulnar band is there, it's sending out a signal saying, I'm here, don't regenerate. When you take it away, now that signal is removed and regeneration starts. And there's actually um, some, some precedent for this. Um, so in, in crabs and lobsters, they have you know, these eyes on, the, on an eye stalk. If you cut off the eye, it will build a new one. And, and, the, and the reason is that the eye sends out a hormone that's sensed by molecules at the base of the stalk. And so when you cut the eye off, the hormone goes away and then it builds a new eye that way. And you can actually prevent it from regenerating by giving it the hormone exogenously. So this is XY organ um, paradigm. So maybe the same thing's happening in Stentor. So how would we identify you know, the equivalent of the hormone here? Some molecule is being made in the membrane ulnar band. So the idea was, well, whatever it is, it's probably gonna be something that's soluble so it can travel out, out of the band and get into the rest of the cell. So one thing that we did, um, so I should say that the mass spec we had done, we, we basically um, very aggressively dissolved the samples because we know that a lot of the cortex is very insoluble. So if you just cut the cell open, the microtubules don't fall apart. So we were sort of aggressively dissolving it. Here, what we did was just very gently lyse it with um, lyse sample with detergent. So we took membrane ulnar band, isolated it, lyse it with detergent, spun out all the insoluble stuff, so all the tubulin and dynein and so on, took whatever was left. And it turns out there wasn't actually that much in that, that was enriched in that pool, really only two kinds of proteins. One was a, a Cal module dependent protein kinase, which, is, which I'll talk about in a second. The other was major vault protein. Now, I just want to take a, a poll to so always do this. Who's ever heard of major vault protein before? I sure as hell had, I sure as heck had never heard of this thing. But it turns out it's this amazing, highly conserved protein that's found all over, you know, again, you know, all throughout eukaryotic biodiversity, humans, plants, everything. And it forms this incredible structure, this gigantic structure, bigger than a ribosome, um, beautiful symmetry. It contains small RNAs of unknown function or purpose. And <clears throat> there's been lots and lots and lots of structural studies um, on this because it's just so, so beautiful and amazing there's almost no idea what this thing actually does. So you read the papers about vaults, you can, you can feel the frustration of the authors because it's so conserved and yet you can't get a phenotype. Um, let's see. Yeah, so, and so, so you, know, you can't get a phenotype. They speculated, oh, maybe it's involved in host pathogen defense, but what's the pathogen and so on. I just figured stentor is so weird. Membrane ulnar band is so unusual. This has got to be the signal because, and this could actually explain what major vault, what the vaults are for is maybe they're actually a, something the cell uses to, to control morphogenesis and regeneration, which is not something people typically study when they study cell physiology. So 
I was like, okay, well, we'll knock this thing down and it's going to be amazing. Unfortunately, there's just no phenotype by RNAi. And so this was done again by Athena Lynn and she tried so many different ways. She knocked down all the orthologs individually and together. She even went to a lab that studies ciliate pathogens and looked for pathogen defense and there's no effect there either. So I don't know what to say. This is like this highly conserved. So I, I was every, everywhere I go now, I'm like this evangelist for MVP. Please figure out what this thing is for because it's just so incredible. It's gotta be doing something. I mean, it's anyway, um, right? I mean, there's no way this would just be sitting there and have no function. Okay, anyway, you get the point. Okay. So then, okay, this, so that was disappointing, no MVP phenotype. So then we looked at the other proteins that were in there and there were a couple of signaling proteins. So there's a CAM kinase, there's a CDPK, both of which are interesting because they have an adenylate kinase um, 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 domain in them, which, you know, what's going on with that. Neither of those gave a phenotype. So this is um, um, a student, Connie Yen, tried really hard and couldn't get a phenotype by knocking those down. But there was also a protein phosphatase 2A subunit. And this does give a phenotype. So this was uh, done by Tatiana Makushak in the lab. So she's got this protein phosphatase 2A, um, a B, um, regulatory B subunit in the membranola band, highly enriched there. It's basically canonical. It fits in with the other ciliate um, orthologs. And when you knock it down, what you see is a, a, a sort of a trio of phenotypes. So the cells go, instead of having this nice um, cone shape, they become flat with these folds on the surface. The membranola band no longer closes up into a ring. It has these it has openings. And then sometimes what you see is the, um, so normally inside the membranola band, there's this region of the cell surface called the frontal field and that thing gets squeezed out. So those, so we don't know why any of this happened, but, but it's very characteristic. We see these phenotypes again and again and again. And if we look by immunofluorescence, we see them also. And so you can see the microtubules, basically you end up having this um, uh, gap in the membranola band. And also you end up having um, breakages in, in, the, in the cortex, which we think might reflect some of these um, folds that you see. So we are getting a phenotype with, um, with, a, with a signaling protein, but it's not the one we wanted. So the cells are not spontaneously making more membranolar bands, which is what you would get if you knock down an inhibitory signal. So we, we still don't see that. So we think what we're seeing is probably a signaling molecule that's involved in actually controlling some of the stages of, of membranolar band development. So maybe it's actually sensing the curvature and driving that. So there's a lot to learn about this, it's very interesting, but it's not, what we, so the dream of getting something that's actually the inhibitory signal is still an elusive dream, but we're still gonna keep looking. Okay, so I think I'm, I basically used up my, my time, I wanna leave some time for questions. I wanna thank the people in the lab who've worked on the Centaur project. I wanna especially acknowledge Mark Slobodnik um, shown here. So he was a student who started this project in the lab. I had some rotation students who tried a few things as pilot experiments. Um, but Mark is really the one who just decided, you know what, I'm gonna work on this and, and make it work. And the reason why I always like to praise him, uh, first of all, he's great, but also in particular, um, I know people, including his committee, tried actively to dissuade him from working on Centaur. They said, well, it's pretty risky, you know, but I wanted to say to, you know, to any, any trainees out there, which is, it's true that there's a risk in doing things that are risky, but there's also a high risk in doing things that are not risky because, because you know, your potential for actually getting something really novel, you know, you, you, you're much more, uh, it depends whether you get lucky or not. So I think, you know, he, he was very brave, but also I think quite smart to just decide to tackle this, but, but he really got it to work. And it's only because of him that I'm here now giving, giving this talk. I also wanna thank our amazing set of collaborators. You know, again, starting something really new in the lab, you can't do it all yourself. You have to, you have, to have, have friends. You know, when I was a kid, my grandfather always said, look, doesn't matter what you do, ultimately, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna need friends to help you. And then that's certainly been, been true for this. So I wanna just acknowledge them. And we've been super lucky to actually have this funded, which I still can't really believe. Um, and I'm, again, very grateful to be here and have the chance to talk to you about this. And I'll stop here and take any questions you may have. And I don't know how we're going to mediate questions from Zoom. Oh, actually, maybe I can. Yeah, I can actually see them here. Yeah. So uh, then I have to talk into the microphone so the people on Zoom can hear. Oh, I, I can. You can just repeat the question. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. Okay, yeah, right, right, sure. Yeah, that's it. Maybe, yeah. I mean, if you want to start with the Zoom people, that's fine. But I have a question about the nucleus, right? Because you said that that if you take all the macronuclei, then it doesn't regenerate. But you also said the micronucleus divides during during regeneration. So why wouldn't it do that? Ah, right. Just by itself, right? If, and then so I have a related question, uh, which is during, uh, I don't know how much you know the mating, the details of mating, right? Because in tetrahymena, the macro, and I mean, it goes in the center too, the ma macronuclei come from micronuclei that divide, right? Yeah, sure. Okay, so so, right. So 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 the first question was, um, 
um, why do the micronuclei divide during regeneration, basically? And and so so the short answer is we don't know, but but it, it is it is definitely true that um, um, if you look at a cell that's regenerating, it looks just like a cell that's dividing. So if you look at at, at a normally dividing cell, I think I might even have a slide of this. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay. So so when a cell so let's see so. On the bottom is, re is regeneration, right? But on top is division. So the way a cell divides is it doesn't actually round up like a mammalian cell does. It stays, keeps its shape, and it builds a new membranellar band halfway down the body, just like it does when it regenerates. And then when the cell does cytokinesis, that membranellar band slots into the cytokinetic furrow, and you end up having an anterior daughter that springs from the head of the posterior daughter, like you know Athena springing from the skull of Zeus. While this is happening, the micronuclei do mitosis. And there's multiple micronuclei. So they don't actually travel to opposite sides of the cell, but just they all just divide and separate somewhat. And then they end up being partitions more or less at random. But also the macronucleus rounds up into an almost spherical shape and then re-elongates again. And then it's pinched in half by, by cytokinesis. So it's, it's, so it's not doing conventional mitosis, but it, it, is, it does get divided. Nobody knows why this happens. We think it's to maybe to mix the genomes up again. So you don't have, have genomic drift. Um, um, we have a we have a whole story on this that I didn't have time to talk about, done by my student Rebecca McGillivary, showing that CSE one, this nuclear um, import factor, well, it's an export in, involved in in controlling recycling of, of the importance, so it ends up being a nuclear import factor. And so, if you don't have CSE one, then so CSE one is upregulated at this stage, and if you if you deplete CSE one, the, the nucleus can't undergo this shape change. Okay, but the interesting thing is that the same nuclear shape change happened in regenerating cells. So their macronucleus rounds up and then re-elongates again, and the micronuclei undergo mitosis. So it, so it kind of looks like when you do regeneration, you might just basically be inducing part of cell division, but without cytokinesis. So one possibility, so one possibility is that all these genes that are upregulated are just, it's just coincidental to the fact that it's doing a similar process, but it could also be that they're being you know, used for something in this purpose, and we don't actually know which of those it is. So that's that. So so basically, we don't know the answer, but but we think it has to do with a commonality of molecular processes. And then in terms of mating, what happens is um, it's actually really really cute. So two stentors will swim together, and they'll touch the rims of their membranellar bands like they're kissing, and then they'll make a little fusion pore right there, and they'll swim along together for quite a while like this. And as they're swimming along together, they're exchanging their micronuclei through that. So it's just like tetrahymena through the fusion um, bridge. And then those micronuclei will end up um, you know, doing meiosis. And then, and then the products of that meiosis will become the new macronucleus and the old one degenerates. So if we could make cells do that when we wanted to, then we could edit the micronuclei and, and get on with it. The problem is we just don't know, only, only very rarely do they, do they mate. Um, yeah, it's just, anyway. Am I understanding correctly, each micronuclei is one whole copy of the genome? Yeah, so so so, so Jenny asked about, about the micronuclei. Yes, each, each one is actually diploid, so it's got two whole copies of the genome. And then and so so what happens is you exchange those micronuclei, which then undergo, then you have meiosis, which happens. So you end up getting haploid versions, and then those things recombine to make um, both new micronuclei and the new macronucleus. So do all of the micronuclei exchange? Or no, it's only it's only some of them. And so we've actually caught cells that were mating, and we can see some micronuclei. Normally, you can't even see the micronuclei in stentoric because they sit in pockets on the surface of the macronucleus. So it's, like, so it's like trying to image a light bulb next to the sun. But during mating, they actually travel. So you can see some of them near them. Near, but we don't think all of them, we don't really know, actually. But presumption is they don't all exchange. So in that division pathway, when does uh, DNA replication happen? Ah, so the question is, when does DNA replicate? So I mentioned that stentor has a, about a four-day doubling time. About three days and 15 hours of that are S phase. So almost the entire lifetime of Centaur is spent re replicating its DNA. And what we see is an extremely strict scaling relation. If, if we take cells at, of different sizes, you can tell the, there's a, the ploidy directly relates to the volume of the cell. And so you know, there's this well-known you know, uh, um, business of, of nucleocytoplasmic uh, uh, ratios. And so one model we have is that, the re is that in order for Centaur to get this big, they have to just make lots and lots and lots of DNA. Um, and so one thing that we, that we would imagine, but we've never been able to show is if you block DNA replication, maybe you could stop cells from, from growing. Yeah. All right, maybe I'll try looking at some of the questions from, uh, from the, the audience viewing from home. So, okay, so, so let's see. So Samir asked, in regenerating cells, do the halves of bisected cells also have identical transcriptomes? It's a great question. So the answer is no, they don't. So you see there's, um, 
quite different genes turned on in, in the two halves. So all the genes involved in making membranellar band are only turned on in the posterior half, not the anterior half, which has inherited the old membranellar band. There is a subset of genes that are only turned on in the anterior half, which we infer are involved maybe in building the, the whole fest, but we don't actually know. Um, and then there are some genes that are turned on in both the anterior half and the posterior half, but that are not turned on when you sucrose shock a cell. And so those, which we call bisection specific, this is, um, we think those could actually be involved in recovery from the wound. So because unlike sucrose where there's no actual membrane wound, when you cut it with a knife, the cells actually do, they're open to the environment. And so, so you know, the cytoplasm is altering its chemical composition and then it seals the membrane. So we're, and so these genes that are, common to both the anterior and the posterior are turned on hours after the membrane has closed. So membrane fusion is very fast, like in 10 minutes or, or maybe even two minutes, you've already got the membrane sealed up again after cutting it. But hours later, you see these other genes being turned on. And if you look at what they are, they're things like ammonium transporters, major facilitators. So proteins involved in transporting small molecules across the plasma membrane. So the model we have is that while, you know, we, I like to view cell, um, cell wounding as like Apollo 13, right? You've got this module out in space you rip the hole in it, you have to seal up that hole as fast as you can before all the oxygen leaks out. But then once you've done that, now you've got, you've got only half the oxygen you started with, you have to rebuild that. And so, so we think that these, or it's like a bilge pump in a, in a ship, you, know, you, you patch a hole in your boat, but now you got to pump out the water that leaked in. So we think that those genes are probably involved in, in the recovery from, from wound healing. And we have some preliminary data now, um, uh, a joint postdoc on Bika and Cardi between my lab and Cindy Tang's lab has found that major facilitator does look like it's involved in, in basically becoming alive again after you've been wounded. All right. Um, okay. Jonathan Church says, um, what percentage, okay, in terms of centriole related genes that are conserved, what percentage of other non-centriole candidate genes involved in regeneration are homologous to human genes? I'm going to say almost all of them. So, the, so stentor genome in general has very few, um, very, they're very, so they're, so if you look at the center genome, there's a small, so it has 35,000 genes approximately in the genome. So it's, it, ciliates often, ciliates have gone through multiple rounds of whole genome duplication. So they have these big expanded gene families. So about 30, 35,000 genes, there's a couple of hundred of those genes that are cil, apparently ciliate specific. So they're conserved with, with paramecium and tetrahyminid, but they're, but, but they're only within the ciliate group. There's only about four that we only see in Stentor, and those are probably assembly artifacts. So I'm gonna say that there's probably almost none that are really just involved in Stentor regeneration, which is actually a very interesting point because the question would be, okay, suppose we do learn how Stentor regenerates. I doubt it's gonna be a Stentor specific process, right? So, that, so and sorry. Okay, so anyway, so I like that question a lot. So, uh, but I would say, yeah, basically they're, they're all conserved. Um, they may not do similar things, but they're at least there. And then, okay, are mitochondria encoded proteins also polarized? That is a great question. So, so the question was, you know, are mitochondrial encoded genes polarized as opposed to simply the ones that encode proteins that go into the mitochondria? That's a great question and I don't know. We're gonna look, thank you for that question. Okay. All right, Benjamin Unruh says, is there any evidence that cell healing is selected against the mammalian cells? Okay, yes. Yeah, so so, so yeah, why is it that Stentor can do this, but you know, HeLa cells, this is like trigger for Daniela, but you know, so you know, humans, normal, normal human cells like HeLa can't. Okay, so um, if you look at, at, the, at, at all biodiversity, say when can cells he heal from wounding and, and regenerate, it's always really big cells that have the ability to do this. I actually don't think that they have any particular pathway that's different from a human cell. I, human cells can recover from wounding. So every time your heart beats, some of your cardiac myocytes are actually getting rips in their plasma membrane that they have to heal. I think the reason why stent, this goes back to the Apollo 13 model. If you take an, an object, you know, um, if you, you know, with, with sort of the fluid inside that, that the good stuff, and you have a, a membrane around it, and you punch a hole of a certain size, stuff starts to leak out. And the question is, how much time do you have to recover before you've leaked out so much that you can't recover anymore? And you can make models. And we've done some, one of these hackathons that Jing mentioned. We, um, we actually made a, a, a computational model. Well, actually, it was a pen and paper model that, that really shows that as the cell volume goes up, you have more and more time to heal the wound of a given size. And so I think it's simply, and, and this, uh, maybe this is kind of self-serving because I'm kind of a large frame individual that you know, being really big lets you bleed out more before you're dead. Wait, actually, can, I, can I add a comment to that? Yeah. I've done a lot of microinjection in cells in just like yeah. cells. And if you uh, poke a really large hole, then it is the cell. Otherwise, this, it also if you inject a lot of stuff, you burst it open, but if you inject just the right amount, it's yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yeah. So, so yeah. So, so again, you know, getting to this question, I'm not so sure there's anything that. So, you know, it, it could be that that these large cells have to evolve ways to defend against being chopped in half by predators and so on. But it could also just be physics of, of very large objects have more stuff to bleed out. Thank you. I'm just following up. So that means uh, <laughs> if you were to cut it not in the in the middle, but uh, you know, you, you were to tune you know, where you cut. So there should be a limit. You know, at some point, you you know, make a cut with. Uh, enough mm. service to run ratios or, or yeah 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 so th right this is something that, that 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 Cindy Tang and I actually keep um it's it's in a grant that we wrote that we still haven't done which is yeah so stentor you can cut pieces about 164th the size of stentor maybe even smaller the key is to have basically what, at least uh, enough of the macronucleus to be alive and you make this tiny little stentor that has a normal shape the prediction is those tiny little stentors should be less tolerant of of, of wounding and that I mean that they might die sooner or take longer or, or whatever. But so there, the, there should be actually a predictable relation between the size that we're, we are looking into that. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Oh, so sorry, this, the question for the, what was, um, is there a limit to how, uh, as you make cells smaller, they become less able to regenerate. And so we, we think maybe yeah, that could be. Okay, um, question from Jonathan Church, to what extent can single cell patterning regeneration form us of tissue level regeneration in multicellular organisms? Oh, I love this question. So yeah, my personal belief is that we're gonna see that, you know, how did tissue organization evolve in the first place? You know, there's so many molecules and pathways involved and you need all of them for the thing, to, for, for, for tissue to form or organ to form properly. How is that even possible? I truly believe that, that we're gonna find the same mechanisms are, in, are, are, are taking place. And there are sort of examples of this where, um, you know, if you think about a, a tissue culture cell moving around in a dish and has like an actin cortex around the outside, um, in many cases, if you have clusters of cells moving around, they end up forming a structure that has an actin um, fence around the outside of the entire cluster. So uh, I, I, I think we should be looking more for sort of um, an, uh, not just analogies, but like identical use of molecules at both um, cellular level and tissue level. And there's a lot of examples in literature. You know, for example, in Drosophila, if you, if you block cytokinesis, the embryo will still form its uh, stripes of peritoneal gene expression. It will still do gastrulation movement of the cytoplasm and so on. Okay. Um, Question from anonymous attendee. Oh, tell me if I'm, am I going over time? I... All right, there's a couple more questions. So anonymous attendee in the context of single cell organisms being complex, how do you answer creationists asking where their complexity comes from? I answer the creationists by saying, I agree with them that this is a very interesting question. Um, my, my response to the question is that we should try to ask the question and investigate it as opposed to just throw up our hands and say, well, science can't account for it. But I agree that it is actually an interesting question. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's my usual way of, and I have actually, you know, I, I've been going to sort of maker fair events up in rural Mendocino County, you know, with survivalists, you know, gun toting, fundamental survivalists, and they all, you know, as long as, yeah, we have actually very interesting conversations about these things. Um, I just think it's an interesting question. I don't think we have to, you know, give up on the idea of, of scientific explanations just because the question is interesting. Um, okay. No, no, no. Not obstinity. In relation to relatively short introns of stentor, would larger introns make regeneration more difficult if split macronuclear nodes couldn't regulate splicing? Possibly, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, I guess one thing that we need to look at is um, there are smaller stentors that can still regenerate, but they're just a lot smaller. And so that might tell us whether, and if those, so we don't know the size of their introns. If they still have small introns, then it could be something to do with regeneration rather than just size. That's an interesting question. All right. Okay, question from Zhao Min Yang. What happens if you were to cut a late stage dividing stentor at different positions? Ah, yeah, right. So, so in other words, um, so the question is, if, if, if you were to take a cell, you know, at late stage of division and then cut it in different places, would you be able to ask about the ability of the different regions of the cell where you cut it to form things like the hold fast? That's an interesting question. There, there has been literature um, like this, for example, where, where a cell would partially regenerate, then you cut it again. Um, in general, what happens is those cells seem to back up and sort of relaunch regeneration again. So, um, so I think in terms of, of, of the cutting approach, it, it doesn't really get at, at, at what I think that the question is, is getting at, unfortunately. What you could maybe do is try to extract, so it's really asking a, a, about, um, is there a diffusing, can we identify diffusing morphogen? Maybe what you could do is extract cytoplasm and, and inject it into another cell and see what that does. That might be the other way to do it, yeah. Ah, and, then, and then another question from, from Jamie. And also, if you were to separate nuclei by position, do they have the same transcriptomics? Yes. So, so this is something um, that we're actually working on. So a postdoc um, in, in the lab, Ashley Albright, is, is trying to do exactly this. So, she's, so previously, she'd worked on methods to do single nucleus RNA sequencing in, in Drosophila embryos. 
And she had, actually her data could back out the, the, the pattern of payroll um, expression just from data analysis. And so that's what she's trying to do. And, and we do believe probably, I think there are gonna be different genes expressed at different ends of the macronucleus. And that would explain why you have it elongated out through the entire cells because you need to have local transcription differences in different regions. But we don't know the answer, but I, that's what I think is gonna happen. Yeah, any more questions from the studio audience? I guess uh, could the students maybe yeah. ask the questions here in the last session last year, the same one. So uh, let's go. All right, well, thanks everybody. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks, Jean. Okay. Now I have to disentangle from all this AV. Yeah, yeah, I realize that that's not that's been like in the uh organizer life.